how, how far apart railroad tracks were in the US um, until they got to the same common width, they weren't able to, to scale it, to, to get it all the way across the United States. There are other examples for telegraphs and for electricity and all kinds of things. But if you think of how transformative just the letter A is, um, once you can create the letter A or an example of that, we think standards are going to be important in blockchain. We're very involved in standards development through the Blockchain and Transport Alliance, et cetera. But once we can get to standards in this space, it creates enhanced network effects. And once you have the network effects, once you have the standards, then all kinds of businesses and support and, and uh, related industries come in to support that. And that drives that network effect and it drives adoption. Be a parallel analogy, uh, and that would be the, the internet uh, and the fact that you know, in the, the 50s and 60s, we had computing technology. We had mainframe computers that were never designed to interoperate. Uh, the, the large computers were designed for a single purpose, uh, banking, uh, transportation, like airline reservation systems. And they were never designed to interoperate. There was no need for a banking mainframe to communicate with a transportation mainframe, reservation system mainframe like, like Delta. So we need a network that can survive any failure of a single point of connection. So they wanted a packet switch network. So they wanted to actually interconnect to develop a network that would survive an interruption, which, which is what came out. Uh, what came out of that was the packet switch network. They connected four university systems and the fact that the university systems being academic computers uh, were used for academics, research, universities had pretty robust mainframe systems. So the idea was, can we connect those mainframe systems with one another for the purpose of sharing information? The problem was each of those computers was designed individually with their own operating system with their own networking protocols to connect it with, with individual terminals that were connecting to the, the mainframes. So what they had to do was define a canonical form, a common format for data to be transmitted. Well, rather than, rather than redesign the mainframe, they created a completely separate computer whose sole purpose was to transfer or, or to translate the information from that mainframe computer into a common format, one that could transmit from one computer to another. So these smaller computers that sat in front of the mainframe computers were known as IMPs. These would define that common format for the transmission of data. So now, if I had two different systems, I would have to create one common format. If I had three different systems, system A, system B, system C, I would have to create a transmission protocol between A and B, between B and C, and between C and A. So I have to have three separate translation protocols. Well, it doesn't progress in a linear fashion from there. If I add four, a fourth, A, B, C, D, now I have to have A to B, B to C, C to D, D B to, to a, a, C to A, A to C, or B to, B to C, B to D. B to D. Yeah, yeah, so I need six. Well, if you add a fifth, now you need a 10. There's a formula for it. A, um, uh, N times N minus one over two. N being the number of systems. Uh, N minus one being the fact that I don't have to communicate with myself. So, and, and that because 
A to B doesn't need a separate translation from B to A. So A to B works to translate. So everything's divided by two. So anyway, uh, so for four systems, you have four times three or 12 divided by two or six. Now you got five systems, five times four, 20 divided by two, 10. You add a six, you have 15. So if, if you've got, imagine 100 different computers, 100 times 99, now you have 4,500 separate translation programs. It's untenable. I mean, it's, it's, it's just unworkable. So the idea of creating an imp meant that you only had to translate into that common format. So now it's a one-to-one. -one. If you have a, a hundred systems, you only need a hundred translation programs just to get that system right. to connect to the canonical or common format. Therein lied the challenge. So this company developed imps to sit in front of the mainframe computers. And that was the start, the birth of an inter-networking protocol, internet protocol, or what we now know as the internet. And one of the key uh, objectives as we started thinking about reimagining what would happen from a transportation perspective, particularly around digital freight matching, how do we create more efficiency, what can it look like, and really being able to connect shippers, carriers, and transportation providers, all three together, really enabling a more efficient way to do business. First things first, I want to give an acknowledgement. Um, IBM's just very honored to, to have you as part of the uh, digital mentorship program as well. So I think that, that this connection uh, goes even deeper. What I've appreciated here is thinking about the buyer values. The buyer values that working with the Arbinger Institute uh, years ago, buyers want something fast, right, cheap, frankly, and easy. And you, you're providing right that timeliness of information. You're making it operate faster. It is the right. We know it's the right information. It's auditable. It's consensus driven. It is based on smart contracts. So I think you've nailed the right. You're able to take some costs out and you're making it easy. So that's what I really like. The opportunity that I'm looking for, especially in the scenario where you just described gas, a hotel night, is there overhead in reporting and being so transparent? And if so, is that juice, that extra work worth the squeeze? So is there really that return? So that's where you get to, you get to play with. What is the benefit to all the participants by providing this and making it more fast, right, cheap, and easy? So I, I'm, I'm liking it. It's what the market's been asking for. And a number of companies have been trying to incrementally get there without taking advantage of new technology. Um, when we think of blockchain, we think of kind of a fork in the road. We think of basically two paths. The first path, and, and I kind of joked about it in my early slides here, the first path is a consortia model. So uh, you, me, one other person, we're going to create a consortia. We're going to sign non-disclosure agreements. We're going to get the lawyers and the attorneys involved. And we're going to um, uh, figure out something and start working on it. And then we add another person, and then we add another person, and we're up to five or 10 or 15 or 50 or even 100 or even 1,000. Um, but it's very cumbersome to keep adding more people in that scenario. We don't actually think that's going to scale in global commerce. We actually think the other side of, the, of kind of the other choice is open uh, and open technology and by comparison, rather than trying to scale something, there are tens of thousands or even more entities in global commerce, all the way to a bicycle delivery. It's not just a, a, a small number. It's a, it's a really large number of entities out there. And whatever solution we have that's going to bring blockchain into all of that is going to have to scale globally. So by contrast to the consortium model, if, you, if we can agree on an open source license, software development license like Apache or MIT or some open source license that we can agree 
on a global basis, by the way, not just in the US, but on a global basis, and, and everybody can look at that and say, I'll agree to use that, then we just scaled this globally. We think for blockchain to be transformative, it has to be bigger than us. That's what he meant by that. Traditionally, we've created our own uh, solutions and we've put a FedEx logo on that. And we don't think we can put a FedEx logo on blockchain and have the world, including our competitors, pay us to use it, nor would we pay to use their solution as well. That's why we think this is going to have to be public and open, uh, ultimately in the global commerce space. Certainly, we've got a long way to go from there. However, now that we've now that I've explained that, now what you're looking at on the slide, if you think of the right side, this this kind of futuristic looking city, uh, kind of looks like Dubai maybe or something like that, or other cities out there. Think of that as blockchain. And you look at at, at us, all of us on this call and this webinar on the left hand side. Here we are, and we can see it you know, to, uh, across there. Um, let's just go do it, right? Why why do we keep talking about it? Let's just do it. Well, the problem is it's never been done before, right? And what we're talking about are really huge issues that involve the globe. So we actually think, and again, what I'm representing in the slide is that there's essentially a canyon between us, between us all trying to get to blockchain and what blockchain will do for us. And we think it's going to require a bridge to be built across that. There are a lot of people that are trying to basically build, as we would say in the U.S., a toll bridge uh, where you'd have to pay to cross it. We don't think they're going to scale very well. We think most people will fail trying to do that. And they are trying to charge to get across this canyon. We actually think the, the bridge needs to be built. We're willing to help build it. And we think it will be a free bridge, a, a no toll bridge. And once we get there, then we can all take advantage of this foundational blockchain layer. So I refer to that as coopetition. And a great example of that is the electronic bill ladings. Yeah. Because we talk about this, I won't let this go ever, Bill. We talk about this and I try to get, you know, some of my shows I've had shivers, carriers, and brokers. And we all fight over how to implement. Simple thing. Why do we have these old bill ladings? And, and we don't even need them anymore from a legal perspective. This contracts govern everything now. Mm -hmm. And why can't we get all... Actually, I'll say four parties. We can't get, yeah. it's a hard time getting it. shippers because they have to adopt the tech. Carriers have to adopt the tech. Drivers have to adopt the tech and then brokers too. So it's hard to get all four to come together. And yeah. I think that further evidence is what you're saying. Well, yeah. And this is a, it's one of those problems that everybody recognizes and would like to change, but mm -hmm. it's not clear. I do think it will take a consortium and I'm very eager. This is something I, uh, we've talked about internally quite a bit and e eager to think about how we can partner across providers to do this because I do think everybody's got to come to the table and it's got to be a little more open. And it's one of those things where everybody would benefit. It would just make the industry better. Um, and uh, I think the number one reason why you haven't seen this change yet is it's because everybody that is trying to come up with this as a product can't figure out where where's the money, right? <laughs> How can I make money? Uh, that's why I think you've got to, it's one of those solutions where we just, we should, we need to work together, come up with a standard and be more open in implementation. I think there's an opportunity to, I think there's a few parts of our business that are like that, where there's just busy work that's created because everybody's doing it independently. It's not clear um, that somebody could build a solution just to address it. But if everybody agreed that there should be a standard and we can work towards it, then as an opportunity to make a more efficient marketplace. Because I agree that the BOL, the BOL processing, I would guess there's you know, tens of millions or not hundreds of millions of dollars just managing that process and handing paperwork. Yeah. And particularly, I saw more interest in this with, with COVID because the, there was the infection risk of handing paperwork around. Absolutely. And so we did see some shippers that tried to move to a kind of partial deal or you, know, you take a picture or the limit handling of it. Um, tried to limit the touches of the BOL, but without fully embracing the eBOL. Yep. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's definitely an area where I think there's an opportunity for innovation. Now is the time, in the light of the exposure that we've had through COVID, not only that the healthcare, transportation, logistics, warehousing, delivery, fulfillment model is at least slightly impaired, if not totally broken. It's also shown up that so is every other one of them. As soon as an exigency that did not match the usual elastic pattern came to pass, 
we found out that actually we had no elasticity. It was actually far more rigid than we thought. And part and parcel of resolving that is to provide the standards that industry now looks back towards as being required. Standards provide comfort to those who are wary of adopting a particular deliverable, a particular mechanism, a particular process or platform, and in so doing, provide a uniformity and interoperability, which is, again, one of the things we found to have been severely lacking in recent COVID-based outcomes. You know, in this environment, as we think about the adapting we're making to working from home, uh, we also are thinking about how do we adapt the way we do business, the way we do business internally with each other, how do we do business differently with our customers, and certainly with the people that we do business with from a vendor perspective. And it's been interesting, the level of collaboration that's really occurred through the work from home environment, from our customers really helping us think through for drivers, how could they be really champions of delivering essential goods and helping support that from a driver perspective. We've been really impressed and excited about our customer connectivity from giving them, uh, you know, meals and places to overnight park they traditionally wouldn't in coordination with a, a few customers. We really developed what we believe can help change, not just right now during COVID, but really long-term the way our industry can be more efficient and really moving us to this next generation of digitization. And so being able to come to a customer facility, helping them see what is available from a bill of lading perspective, but transmitting that bill of lading directly there between the shipper or receiver and the driver, all without any human interaction. That was, has been a big innovation for us as an industry. But that has not transformed, it's not evolved, and it's because technology's not really been available to help us evolve. But you think about what's happening in the digital freight platforms and really the revolution that's coming is being able to access information in near real time for everyone. So you think about being an EDI transaction-based system that was written years ago, now we are moving to an API direct connectivity so that I can call on information that I want as the end user, what I want, when I want, how I want to get that. Um, we always have the saying, two heads are better than one, but you also could say the same thing, two companies are better than one. You really want to collaborate if you're going to innovate. Talk about, you, you touched on it a little bit in your keynote, but who do you really, who does J.B. Hunt want to collaborate with within this year, maybe the next few years down the line? Well, although we have really smart people, we also work with really smart people. And so not everything that we work on uh, solves for the most efficient transportation network in North America. We need people that are really great at doing that work to come alongside us so that we can both do that industry together. I think that's an important component. For us, we're interested in working with carriers. We're interested in working with 3PLs. Uh, you know, we have been in talks with 3PLs about um, how could we think about 360 empowering them. We don't think every 3PL will go away. We don't think that we'll be the only marketplace, but we do believe that we can create the most efficient transportation network in North America. And to do that, we have to be very open-minded as to how we use that. Think of open source, uh, if you will. We are talking to our customers about it. We're talking to other 3PLs. We're talking to anybody we believe has a skill set that is different than ours and of an expert that we are, how can we put the two together and make it yeah, I know Slack was a buzz when you talked about working with your competitors, and I know sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, we can't work with our competitors. But as you said, you're willing to talk to anybody. We're going to transition now. Um, I, I would advise anybody, you always want to be in front of this curve rather than behind in the sense that oh, you, yeah. you want to be educating yourself around how things are changing, like what technologies come to market, how it could be used, and then there will be, there will always be new opportunities. And I think a lot of what we can't predict now, which I'm excited for in 10 years, is once all these new capabilities and this real-time freight and instant, everything has been percolated throughout the market, I do think there's going to be all sorts of new startup ideas or new 
an interesting uh, layering of other technologies on, on top of that. So we want to invite everybody who is a legitimate stake, potential stakeholder. We don't want to miss anybody. So we're building a directory. And out of that, possibly some ideas about things that could that this information could help uh, help people find each other in different contexts. That's actually there is actually a lot on the ground in in operation that's actually working to support this idea of a, an organizational ecosystem that would allow for the implementation industry wide of a TUID system and sharing and then handing the baton to the industry to take that uh, forward in terms of governance and management. So it, it's not just an idea. There's a lot of practical stuff that's already in place. And we're pretty much there on all of these, except possibly the in industry directory is still a work in process. So um, we, we invite, absolutely invite people to, to come in and ask questions, dig in, talk to us, explore these things. I mean, we do have specific things that we can, uh, we can share and discuss. Why DFM Data Core and why now? And why standards? Because DFM Data Core is the digital transformation sought after by governments, corporations and consumers in the green society that we envision for the rest of the 21st century. Accepting that that digital transformation cannot be a digital transition as other revolutions or evolutions have been, that it is truly a transformation that is required if we are to meet the exacting standards, if we are to accomplish environmental enhancements, if we are to really reduce fuel wastage, carbon emissions, if we are really to stop pounding our highways with futile missions to pick up a non-existent freight and if we are to maximize the quality of life for truck drivers, warehouse personnel, dispatch, and truly streamline the supply chain, this is the only way. Thank you.